welcome to this past paper walkthrough and um, this is for AQA combined science and um, this is paper one higher tier and it's from 2023 so you may have done it as a mock exam or you may not have done it at all either way I hope you find it useful this question on this paper uh, we are talking about renewable energy sources so renewable uh, we should know means essentially uh, source uh, won't run out um, or it is kind of infinite as opposed to a non-renewable energy source. Um, now natural gas is a fossil fuel so it's not that. Nuclear fuel, fuel we need to mine underground like uranium so it's not going to be that one so it's geothermal um, which is uh, heat from the earth which won't run out um, for the next few billion years anyway. Um, next question um, is a what we call a prefix in science so how many joules is a gigajoule um, so 36 gigajoules it tells us there and we've got four options down here now we need to know prefixes it's one of the um, kind of uh, things you definitely need to know in physics comes up a lot um, is the same thing as times 10 to the power 9 so to give you another example um, m would be mega um, and that would be times 10 to the power 6 uh, but it's not talking about that here it's talking about giga so therefore we tick the third box now the other part of this question is a really big six marker which is an interesting type of six marker because there isn't lots of um, kind of previous knowledge required um, it's one of those questions where you have to do quite a lot of analyzing um, and applying your knowledge to uh, different situations uh, which is kind of one of those a03 uh, an assessment objective three in science now the question itself is probably not as hard as it first seems because you've got two quite complex looking graphs here and um, let's read the question we'll unpack what kind of things we could talk about uh, to get our six marks here so the question says explain that's our command word uh, the changes in power output from both solar and wind energy between 2014 and 19 and it said you should include an explanation of the change in power output during a typical year. Now, the first part of the question talks about 2014 to 2019. So that's this time period here. So that's essentially the first graph. The second part talks about in a typical year. Now, a typical year, if I just zoom down a second, is obviously between January and December. So that's the second graph. So basically, we've got to mention both graphs in our answer. Okay, now um, when we're talking about um, six mark questions, it's absolutely fine to use bullet points, um, but we are going to do a little bit of kind of analyzing the trends first. We are always going to make sure we are trying to explain each one. So I'm going to go through each one at a time and do a little analysis, um, then just an explanation uh, as we go through. Right, so let's look first at this top graph. Um, so um, let's talk about the trends first of all. Um, so we're going to look at wind, which is the kind of uh, lighter shaded um, bars. Uh, so generally speaking, wind, and we're not just going to say wind, we're going to mention the axes. Um, so wind, uh, the mean um, power output uh, increases. Um, increases. Now I've mentioned the years already so I don't need to mention them again um, but that overall increases. Then solar um, we can also note so that's the darker um, kind of uh, bars um, the mean power output also increases. Okay now one thing we could say here is that the increase in solar is probably not as big overall as uh, the increase in uh, winds but we'll come on to that later. And next we're going to talk about the explaining okay so this whole question is about explaining so we don't get uh, that many marks if we can't explain it and um, now the explanation for um, both these really is easier than you might think um, so the idea is um, it's going to increase um, though it's not like it's getting more windy but um, there's more um, wind I was going to say because that's a good word to use um, more wind turbines are built It's the same for solar. So we can say solar, and uh, this is because um, more solar panels or solar cells um, panels are installed. Okay, um, there's a bit of additional information we could talk about here. We could talk about the relative increases, um, but you might have spotted there's this year here um, seems to kind of buck the trend a little bit compared to the other years. Now we don't know exactly the cause for this, but um, we can mention it and we can ha kind of hazard a guess. Um, so the year is 2016. Um, so 2016 kind of bucks these trends, um, doesn't follow the pattern uh, as such. Um, so we can say wind power was less than um, 2015, but one reason might have just been it was less windy. Um, it may have been less windy. Now, as with all six markers, you don't need to mention all these points to get marks, um, but we're going to write down as many different things as you possibly can. 
Um, next, we're going to talk about the mean, um, uh, sorry, the, the kind of typical year, so um, January to December. And this should be the easier way of getting marks on this question, um, but people didn't uh, when they did this exam, probably because it's the second graph down. So um, let's have a look then, at, uh, which is uh, what we can say uh, for this. So we could say uh, for most of the year, um, which one's higher? Well, it's wind, it's the solid line uh, wind, and we're going to say power output um, is greater than solar. So greater than solar um, power. Um, next, we're going to talk about where there are two obvious trends here. Uh, we're going to say, well, wind in the summer months um, in the summer I'm going to say in summer months so you could say the specific months themselves like June July August etc uh, so in the summer months um, you can see the power output from solar is greater um, than wind Okay, and let's explain that one. Um, so that one is a really obvious one. Um, it's uh, because it's sunnier in the summer. Now we can also talk about um, the converse, um, so the opposite, um, which is to talk about why is wind greater in the winter. Um, so you can see in winter months, um, wind is wind power is greater. That's because higher power output um, but, uh, than a solar. Um, that's because it's windier, as it is windier in those months. Okay, so um, one of those questions that looks really tricky um, when you first see it, and there's a lot to write down um, for the six mark question. It might be worth going to the back if you run out of room. Um, but the actual content there is not that tricky. It's just analyzing the graphs and giving an explanation, having a look at the command words that you're asked to use here. Hey, onwards to question two. Uh, don't miss out on questions like this because there's no answer line. And um, for this question, uh, you've got a complete figure four um, with where a voltmeter um, should be connected. So regardless of the context, which is a little bit kind of tricky to get your head around, um, a voltmeter we know should be um, connected across um, to a component. Now, the slight tricky thing is here, you've got two of them, um, but we can kind of go across both of them like this. So dot either side and a voltmeter should go across both sets of components like so. Next one um, is one of the trickier things you could be asked about electricity, which is, and uh, says the student calculates the total resistance of the two resistors and says so their answer is 26. Why can't it be correct? So on this diagram, we should notice that these two resistors are in parallel with each other, okay, as opposed to they could be connected in series. Now, in, when we talk about in series versus in parallel, um, there is a different rule for how resistors um, get connected. So the rule for in um, parallel is that the overall resistance um, is lower than the lowest resistance here. Okay, so the lowest um, resistance. Now I'm going to explain that. You don't need to know it for this question necessarily, but I'm going to explain it um, as we go through as well because I think it's really good um, kind of revision to know. Um, but what we say to answer this question is that the total uh, or the overall resistance um, must be less than 20 ohms. Okay, and the reason for that um, is because that rule I just said, the total um, resistance must be um, uh, of the resistors, sorry, resistors, and we're talking about in parallel here. So resistors in parallel um, is less than, than the uh, resistance of the lowest or smallest resistance. Okay, so we're going to take a second just to break that down. So the idea is if I've got a cell and I've got a resistor, okay, and the resistor kind of restricts the flow of current. So essentially um, slows current down, slows electrons down. Now let's say this is um, like 5 ohms, to use a different example. Now if I'm adding an extra branch in there, regardless of what resistance this is, so it could, this, it could be 10 ohms for example, you're going to increase the current. Now that's because there is an increase in paths for the electrons to take, and that means that you can have uh, more of them, okay? Now, any increase in current means that overall resistance actually goes down the more resistors you add in parallel. So that then leads to it being, well, in this case, the overall resistance is less than 
five ohms because it has to be less than what it was originally before we had this resistor in there. So that's that kind of question explained. Right, next question, um, quite a standard looking uh, question involving an equation. I'm just gonna write it down in symbol form, which you can do if you don't wanna write the words, um, voltage or potential difference equals current times resistance. Um, and we've got to calculate potential difference across uh, two resistors and it tells you this total resistance in that case there. Um, now, before we start undergoing to this, we should note that this is not the regular unit for current. Current is normally measured in amps. Um, if you have a small case M, not to be confused with a big case M would be mega. Uh, small case M is milli. So milli um, as a prefix is times 10 to the minus three, or uh, you could say divide by a thousand, um, just like millimeters uh, to meters. Okay, so um, always write it down here in case you forget later, uh, 480 milliamps um, is going to be divided by and calculated by a thousand is 0 0.480 amps so we can use that in our equation um, with no rearranging to do here which is quite nice so 0 0.480 times by the resistance which if we were to work out a uh, final answer by putting in our calculator is going to equal uh, 3.6 so therefore 3.6 uh, we put down in our answer box Okay, continuing question two over the page, um, we've got a graph, um, which the question asks us to, um, well, look at the results here, and there's a couple of things to do over this side. We've got to um, label axes, we've got to plot points and draw a line of best fit. Um, so we're gonna do those in order. Um, now, labeling axes, um, I know it will take a little bit of time, but please don't be lazy. Don't miss out on easy marks by messing up the order of those. Uh, what we change, our uh, independent variable goes on our x-axis. Uh, hopefully it's obvious from the numbers, um, that's what we need to write down. So we write down resistance of R in ohms, literally just copy and paste it. Um, and up here we have the total uh, resistance uh, of the circuit. Okay, and again, that's in ohms. Okay, uh, next we're gonna plot our points in. Um, so we are missing the 15, uh, which is 8.6. So we're gonna go to eight and uh, nine's up there. So there are five gaps between eight and nine. So therefore eight and then 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, it's going to be this one here. Uh, next we've got 20, uh, which goes up to 10. That's a much easier one to point, uh, plot, sorry, and that point goes there. So there's our first two all done. Next, we're gonna draw a line of best fit. Now, please don't fall into the trap of always thinking lines of best fit are always straight. I know in maths they are, in science they're not. You quite often have curves. Grab your ruler, um, if it looks like a straight line, then it's a straight line, but this one hopefully is obvious, it's far more obvious, it's a curve. So to draw a line of best fit, um, you need to get a pencil out and you're gonna need to try and draw it as accurately as you possibly can as a curve, not sketching. I'm gonna draw it in pen just because I trust myself um, and I don't have a pencil handy. Um, but in this case, you wanna go from kind of zero, zero. You don't have to go uh, hit any points. You can go between as many points as possible. So something like that. I've got a couple below, I've got a couple above, and that'll be absolutely fine for the line in this question. Now from your line of best fit, uh, for the next part of the uh, question, it says what resistance of R would give a total resistance of 4.4? So the total resistance is this axis here. So let's get our ruler out. Um, so there's four, there's five. Uh, 0.4 would be two squares above four. So I'm gonna draw a line from here um, up to this point here and then go down. Uh, now for me, that works out. Um, there's 10 squares between five and 10. So each one will be 0.5. So that works out uh, for me about 5.5 ohms. And uh, now luckily, even if you did an incorrect line of best fit or one that's not quite like mine, as long as you make it clear from the graph, like use your ruler, um, then you'll get that mark there as long as it matches up um, with your graph overall. Okay, finishing off uh, question two then. Um, now, we need to know about different types of error um, with reading um, different, well, reading anything in science really. Um, so the person stepping on some scales, let's read this bit carefully. It says the analysis shows a reading of point, 0, 0. 0.0. When the student steps on, the scale is 64.8. They step off the scales and now they show a reading of 64.1. So what is the um, kind of value between, what is the error called when you have a reading between two scales? Um, now it's called a random error. There's two types of error. Please look at my practical skills video um, if you would like to a bit more information on this. But random is kind of like a one-off um, type of error. It doesn't affect the reading every time because the, the equipment seems to be fine because it's uh, read 0.0, .0 at the start. 
Next, go on to 2.8 then. We've got a bit of analysis here. There's another one of those A03 questions. You're not expected to know anything in your revision about body water percentage. Sounds like more of a biology question to me, um, but we need to be able to use this graph to find out a couple of things. So let's have a look on the right hand side then, uh, what the question is asking. It says the student, uh, sorry, the total resistance to the student's leg is 600 kilo ohms. A healthy water, uh, body water percentage is between 45 and 65 percent. The different measurements of the mass of the student mean the student could either be in category A or B. And it says evaluate, uh, which kind of makes makes a comparison and a conclusion. Okay, um, what uh, evaluate uh, this if the student has a body water a higher healthy body water percentage. So we're only looking at A or B. So let's just uh, circle that in our graph now to in case we forget later. We are not worrying about C at all. So how do you go about doing this question? Well. Exam technique wise, you've got to think, um, well, what can I use? I haven't got any information here to work this out. I've got to use my graph. The only information we have is the resistance and we know between 45 and 65. So let's use the first thing, resistance. It says at 600 kilo ohms. This is already in kilo ohms, this graph, so you don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, so I'm gonna do a line going upwards to point A, sorry, line A, and I'm also gonna continue it to line B. Now, for each of those lines, we can see on the side here, we've got the body water percentage. So what we can actually do is to draw across uh, and find out for A and B what the body water percentage actually is. So for line A, so that's this one here, uh, we can hopefully see it goes along with 60%. This one, on the other hand, um, is more like 68%. Now, only one of those is within our healthy uh, range, which they mentioned earlier in the question, and that is line A. So how would we go about writing up this as an overall answer then? Um, and they would give you marks just for uh, checking from your graph that you've uh, kind of done something like that correctly. Um, so what we'd say is that um, uh, category A, so if in category A, the body water um, percentage, that's what the graph is showing, um, I'm going to say percentage equals uh, 60 or you know a range between 60 and 62 uh, equals 60 percent and then category B um, the second line we drew uh, the body water percentage um, is a bit higher uh, which is 68 percent okay and then there's a line concluding because that's what we've got to do for evaluate we've got to compare and conclude so the idea is then um, if in category A uh, the body water um, percentage is healthy. And I'm running out of space here. Obviously, uh, you can write smaller than this. Um, and you could say, um, but in cat B, uh, it's not healthy. Okay, just a simple kind of statement at the end uh, to make sure you are proving you know what the question is asking you to write about in the first place. Okay, so let's have a look then these two questions, kind of how would I rate it? Personally, that is a really, really hard question in terms of data analysis. Um, you know, be, uh, there might be one of those in the real thing. Uh, you just gotta use your exam technique to work it out. Uh, this is relatively easy. Uh, even though it's a curve, you should be nailing all the marks for that one. Um, and question two, the rest of it, I'd say this is relatively straightforward. There is a conversion to doing it as well. Um, and that's something you need to know about resistors. Uh, question one overall, I mean, it is a six marker. So, um, you know, it depends on how confident you are with those. Um, but probably a medium um, for that one overall uh, so far. Okay, continuing uh, on with question three then, and we've got a diagram of the national grid. Uh, it tells us what it does, gives us a diagram, um, and we've got a couple of transformers that are labeled. Um, now, uh, you don't get marks for in the question, but we should know that first one, um, when it's gone from power stations, um, then through the cables, uh, this one is called a step up transformer, and this one is called a step down. Now, we're not concerned with step down uh, for the time being. We are just talking about step up, um, and the question is an explain question. How does it increase the efficiency? Now, we should know efficiency, if you increase the efficiency, essentially, you have uh, more useful or less energy wasted. Uh, so how does it go about doing that? Now, in terms of um, step up transformers, um, this question comes up a lot, okay? You need to know this. So what it does uh, is it increases um, the voltage or the potential difference. Um, and when it does that, it also decreases um, the current. So current being the rate of flow of charge of electrons. Now, as it does that, decreasing the current is really important because what that means is um, there's gonna be less um, heat or thermal um, energy uh, lost or transferred um, into the surroundings, okay? Into the surroundings. 
Now, um, that only comes by, uh, you don't need this for this question necessarily, but any Y, if you've got electrons flowing through, um, the idea is if you have less current going through, there are less collisions inside the wire, um, causing there to be less heat overall. Now, just to explain this bit as well, um, just for those of you who are curious, um, it's something you need to know, uh, but the explanation actually is because if you have a constant amount of energy or power supplied to the transformer, decreasing the current is a consequence of you increasing the voltage um, because those two things have to balance each other out. Otherwise, you're creating more energy or losing energy, which just doesn't make sense. Um, so um, let's uh, leave that one there for the time being, um, which is pretty nice. Um, and now we've got an equation sheet over here. Now, this is an unusual equation to find in a paper one for combined science, um, but it is on your equation sheet, which is always handy. Uh, so the equation looks like this, and I'm going to write down in symbol form and explain what each part means. Um, so V, or the potential difference, times by I, or the current. Um, this is all in the primary, um, uh, sorry, in the primary coil of what, in a transformer. That's what the P stands for, equals the voltage or potential difference um, times by the current in the secondary um, part of this thing called the transformer. Now for combined science, you don't need to need loads more detail than that. Uh, we're gonna plug our values in. PD across the primary coil, so that's my uh, VP, so 400,000. Um, and the current, uh, we don't know. So I'm just gonna write down IP. You could write an X or a question mark again. That is absolutely fine. We also know our um, potential difference across the secondary coil is 11,000 um, and uh, sorry beg your pardon we do know the uh, current across the primary coil um, is 660 so we've made that awful mess there um, and the thing we're trying to work out beg your pardon, is the current in the secondary coil so this one here so even though it's a bit unfamiliar just plug your numbers in and that gets your mark straight away Next, I would um, personally do this um, first. You don't ha uh, have to, but you can um, put it in brackets if you want um, as a calculation. Uh, it just becomes a bit less messy later on. Now you need to get IS, the thing you're trying to find by itself. So how do I do that? I get rid of a timesing by dividing. So I divide both sides by 11,000. And again, keep around the brackets, what's going on there. But if you put that in your calculator, you should find that gives you 24,000 amps, which seems a bit high for current, um, but it's a transformer, it's the national grid. Uh, these things can be pretty big. And 3.3 uh, uh, talks about the lamps between them. So it's not going to be the first thing because current never gets used up. Current can't be dissipated. That would be heat. Um, so left with this one and this one and it is because the street lamps are connected in parallel. As we mentioned previously, um, that affects the current. Um, so it's the last box. Okay, let's uh, get around to the end of question three. Um, so we've got the street lamp and we've got a circuit with a battery, a resistor um, and a um, light dependent resistor in here. So what the question asks, it says explain what happens to the potential difference across resistor R as the light intensity decreases. Now if you've uh, managed to clock the fact that this is a LDR, there's only one thing we need to know about in a light dependent resistor at um, GCSE, which is if you increase the light or the light intensity, what happens to the resistance is that the resistance goes down. So it follows that kind of rough relationship there. So because of a three mark question, always start off with something you do know. Um, so in this case, um, light intensity increasing means that resistance decreases. Resistance, um, we say of the LDR, LDR decreases. Okay, so that's a true statement we know before we've been talking about potential difference. Okay, now we know, as we talked about earlier, resistance um, going down in a circuit uh, means there are less electrons going through per second. So therefore, that means that the current um, in the circuit decreases as a result. So less resistance means current in the circuit overall um, decreases. There are less electrons moving around per second. So then we've got to talk about what happens to uh, the potential difference. That's what the question asks us across R. And I'm just going to stop myself there because I've just realized um, I made a mistake in this question. It talks about light intensity decreasing. Um, so if it decreases, it's the opposite. Less light means um, that the resistance increases overall. So sorry about that. I misread the question initially. 
okay um, right so um, that means then if we talk about um, the resistance is increased that makes more sense what I said earlier about the current uh, decreasing now as well as this uh, now across the LDR if the resistance goes down um, one fact you would need to know comes up uh, can be useful in series circuits is the potential difference um, also goes down uh, the idea is there's a greater less resistance so there's less energy being lost uh, for each electron as it goes through so what that means is then if the potential difference is going down um, across this part here um, sorry beg your pardon increasing they're proportional I forgot about my correction to my answer uh, so resistance going uh, up I mean potential difference goes up there's a fixed amount of voltage or potential difference in the circuit let's say for example it's nine volts if this has a greater share of it it's not because there's more from the battery it means that potential difference across here has gone down so then we'd say a potential difference across um, R so this resistance uh, decreases uh, we don't need to explain why in this case uh, because it has a lower um, share of the overall PD so of the overall um, PD from the battery you could say uh, in that case Okay, um, on to the last bit of question three. Um, we've got to calculate resistance when we know the current and we know the power transferred by the um, resistor. Um, so in terms of equations, got those three things in. It's power equals current or I squared times by R. Uh, before we dive into it, we should spot this is uh, not in amps. This is in milliamps. So we're going to write down the same as we covered earlier, 20 milliamps. Uh, you divide by 1,000 or times by uh, 10 to the power minus 3. It's the same thing. Either way, when you calculate that, it gives you 0 0.020. So write it down there to make sure you've got a mark for that in the question. So let's do our uh, kind of FIFA technique, make sure we're writing in, inserting our values first before we do anything else. Um, the power given is 6.0, so I'll write that underneath my P for power. The current we just said is 0 0.020 squared because it's squared in the question and the resistance we are trying to find. So to get rid of this value here, um, it's currently times by R, you've got to do divide by um, on both sides. Um, so therefore you're gonna have 6.0 divided by 0 0.020 squared um, equals R. That's our fine tuning over and done with. The last stage is just to put it into our calculator and it comes out to be 15,000 ohms, um, which is quite high, um, but uh, yeah, it's a string that's quite a big object. Um, the resistance is normally quite a high number. So to review that question then, uh, I think this calculation is relatively um, okay once you've done the conversion, so I'd say medium. Uh, this question here I'd say is a really tricky kind of three marks to get in the paper in terms of being able to explain it. It's quite complex, a bit of A-level physics there. I'd say this one's straightforward, this one's another medium because it's just a calculation and this part here you need to know that that should be on a flashcard um, you've got somewhere um, talking about transformers in the national grid. Okay, moving onwards to question four. Um, gives you some information. This is about how, how science works kind of question. Um, it says uh, results and conclusions of the scientist are checked by other scientists before the results are published. That process, uh, you need to know this, is called peer review. So peer being kind of like your peers are other students. Reviewing means they're reviewing it overall. Uh, next one, the property means uh, what are we talking about with nuclear radiation, so something about it um, that causes increased risk of cancer, and um, that is because it is ionizing. Okay, so it's the ionizing that causes the mutations, causes this cancer risk to increase. Uh, the unit for radioactivity source um, is called Becquerel's. Um, so it's a little bit of a niche unit, um, but you need to be able to uh, memorize it. Um, it's the unit for activity, um, the short form is BQ. Um, and next we're going to talk about, it says uh, the scientist placed a radiation detector, like a Geiger counter, near the sample and measured the count rate. Why is it that if I've got a source here, for example, um, emitting radiation, if I put my detector here, why are those two numbers not the same? Why is the activity not the same as the count rate measured? Now the idea is that because the radiation is kind of going outwards in all directions, only some of it is going to be detected by this machine. Okay, so that would be kind of mark one is by implying it doesn't have to be in these words necessarily, uh, but not all the uh, radiation uh, emitted is detected um, by the counter. So they've just detected all radiation emitted is detected. Okay. And the reason for that, a couple of ways of putting this, um, you could talk about it being absorbed in the air, you could talk about it um, kind of spreading out, emitting in all directions, um, Okay, but uh, I'm going to go as it, as it is emitted in all directions, um, 
or you could say it's uh, some of it's uh, or uh, it's absorbed by air either of those would be absolutely fine here Okay, um, let's look over to the other side. Um, we've got some data on um, the, the scientists measuring the sample, uh, and the, its count rate, and varying the distance between the sample and the detector. It goes from two centimeters to five to 10, and the count rate changes um, accordingly. So the next question says, um, explain which type of radiation was emitted by the sample. Now, whenever you see type of radiation, you've only got three options. You've either got alpha, um, gamma or beta or beta or gamma don't know why I did in that order um, so you've got to figure out which one it's going to be um, now you should know about the ranges for each of these okay so beta um, is roughly about a meter a gamma kind of goes on for kilometers alpha is the one there it's a few centimeters so what we're dealing with here two between two and ten centimeters it goes to zero within ten centimeters so it is alpha um, radiation that's present uh, you need to mention that in your answer and the reason is because um, alpha particles um, can't be detected beyond five centimeters or alpha um, radiation um, uh, is absorbed or cannot travel uh, 10 centimeters okay so you can figure that one out from the question uh, there's a few different ways of saying that um, and you cannot get the second mark in this question without getting the first mark Okay, over to 4.6. Uh, this question is all about uh, half-lives. Okay, so um, first things first with half-lives, uh, you just know the definition for it. Um, so half-life is the time taken uh, for the source to go down to half of its original uh, count rate in this case. So let's say its count rate starts at 100% um, or starts at one, the time taken for it to go down to half um, of what it is originally. Okay, now the numbers in this question are a little bit sneaky because um, they don't seem like they're related at all, uh, but trust me, they are. Whenever you've got um, half-lives, you're looking at things halving or doubling. Um, so what we're gonna do is figure out how many half-lives um, we've got for the data we have in the table. We don't know about this one. Um, so we're just gonna work out number of half-lives in 60 minutes, so between zero and 60. So what we go about doing is, and you can just do it on your calculator, a bit of trial and error, or you can divide them if you want to. Um, but I'd say you go one, five, six, eight, and you halve it once, and then you halve it again, and then you halve it again, and you halve it again until you get down to 98. So essentially, um, if you get uh, halve it four times, um, you'll get to 98, okay? So uh, halve it once, halve it twice, halve it again, and halve it again uh, equals uh, four half-lives. Okay, so in that case, then what that means is that one, if 60 minutes are four half lives, so you can say 60 divided by four means 50 minutes, 15 minutes, beg your pardon, is one half life. Okay, so 50 minutes is one half life. That means that this is halved twice to go down to 30. Okay, so if you stick into your calculator, um, what one, five, six, eight halved once is seven eight four and half twice is three nine two okay so i'm just going to go down here just to make it really clear so 30 mins um is two half lives a bit of calculation in there just in case so divide by uh to times by half and times by half again for two half lives and that equals three nine two counts per second and that is the final answer for this question Right, to finish off question four, um, it says, why was the half-life calculated from the second sample slightly different to the first sample? Um, so the idea is different temperatures doesn't affect it. The size um, uh, wasn't, uh, doesn't necessarily make a difference to the, the count rate here. Um, the idea is it's a random process. We should know that as a fact anyway. So it's a good thing to just uh, choose an answer you know is true regardless of the other options. Right, moving on to question five, um, which is a bouncing uh, toy. Uh, so definitely not a required practical. Um, and in this question, um, for the first part, um, it talks about how something affects the measurement. It's a really good example of how um, have different measurements uh, and key terms you could be asked of in your GCSE. Uh, so uh, hopefully you guys can realize observing uh, position B is better than position A. Um, but you can't just say it's better. We can talk about why it's better. Okay. Um, so if in doubt with questions like this, um, it just doesn't always work out. But uh, the reason it's better um, is because the measurement is what we say more accurate. Now I'm going to put an extra extra detail in here um, because you could say uh, actually it comes up in the next marking point anyway. Why is it more accurate? Because it's an explain question. So the idea is your eye um, is level. So this person is a bit below, whereas this person the eye is level. 
um, with the height of the toy or with where the toy is in relation to the ruler. Okay, now this is an example and it's a good one to learn of what's called parallax error. Okay, um, so parallax error being where you're not viewing something in line with what you're measuring. So let's say two people, one viewing something from here, one's viewing something from over here, they're going to view it slightly differently. Okay, so it comes up with tractors, comes up with anything with rulers and things like that. Okay, on to uh, question 5.2, we've got an equation uh, type question um, and it gives us the height of the toy, gives us the energy, gravitational field strength and we're trying to find the mass. Now, um, I'm hoping we can spot this fairly straightforwardly because it tells you the height and gravitational potential energy, etc. That the equation we're going to use is gravitational potential energy equals m mass times by g gravitational field strength times by a change in height. Now, before we uh, dive into this question, let's get our marks for converting. It's a nice easy one. This one, 64 centimeters needs to be in meters. Uh, you need to divide that by 100, uh, which makes 0.64 meters. So write it down straight away in case you lose your marks later on. Next, we're going to put our values in. So the energy is 0.49, and the mass we don't know, so I'm going to leave that as an m for now, or you can leave it as an x. Um, and the change in height we've just said is 0.64 meters. Now, to work out m, uh, you just get both these terms onto the other side. So you could times them together first if you wanted to. It's absolutely fine to do that. I'm going to uh, leave them in brackets first of all. Um, but the opposite of timesing is dividing. Uh, so I divide both sides by 9.8 and also by 0.64. Now, when you put that into um, your uh, calculator, you'll get an answer that looks something like 0 0.0078125, etc. And this is where um, the final mark, and this is a five mark question, comes from. It says two significant figures. So, how we find significant figures is we go start counting when we get to the non zero number. So, I'm going to start, stop counting, zero, 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 start counting here, one, two, and stop counting there. So, therefore, it's 0 0.0078. Eight. Does it sound reasonable? I mean, yeah, that's about um, 7.8 grams uh, for a little toy. Sounds about right to me. Okay, down to question 5.3. Uh, we talk about closed systems. Um, so the information says when the spring launches a toy into the air, the temperature of the air increases. Why is it not a closed system? So uh, this is something you just need to know. What is a closed system? Um, closed system, um, uh, write it down even if you don't know why it's not a closed system. Uh, closed system, uh, you say the total... Uh, energy is constant or you could say there's no energy transferred in and out um, so no energy in slash out of the system and uh, now in this case um, where's the energy going well it says the temperature increases that's your hint um, so it says here the energy um, from the toy where does it go uh, you could say is transferred uh, to the surroundings or transferred to the air um, so I've got a lot of miles off the bottom of that, uh, to the surroundings, uh, or to the air, um, and you could even put in that says heat if you wanted to. Okay, uh, so that's question five. Let's review the last couple of questions. I'd say those both together are probably medium uh, as a calculation um, and as 5.3 overall. Um, I'd say this one is about medium. You need to know about practical skills. It'll be the thing you forget to revise uh, overall. Let's go back to question four briefly, just as an indication of what we've got going on. I'd say this one's a relatively tricky hard um, half-life question. Um, we'd be a bit unlucky if that came up in the real thing, but it might do. I'd say this one should be kind of easy in terms of the data you're given. And probably the worst of ones down here for question four, I would say about medium. Okay, uh, that all set. Uh, let's scoot forward to question six. Um, we're looking at pressure, so pressure in a coffee machine. Uh, now, it talks about hot coffee increases temperature of air uh, in the chamber. Uh, now, temperature affects pressure. Uh, it doesn't tell us how. It says explain how it changes. Um, so if it doesn't tell you uh, how something happens, it just tells you that it does. Uh, it says it changes. You will almost always get a mark for talking about what happens to the pressure. Now, we should know that pressure is proportional to uh, temperature. What that means is that uh, temperature goes up. Uh, this also goes up. So our final answer, you get a mark for saying this, is that pressure um, will increase. Okay, so if in doubt or if you're running out of time, um, please make sure if it says how does something change, it doesn't say if it goes up or down, just you know, write down uh, that initially. Okay, now to explain that part of the answer, we need to look at what happens to particles when the temperature of the gas or the liquid, whatever you're talking about, um, changes. Okay, so if, if temperature goes up, um, tem we say something like temperature increasing. Um, means the particles 
have more, um, what do we say, kinetic energy, um, or you could say they move faster. That's absolutely fine to say um, as well. Now, how do we link that to pressure? Well, if they're moving faster, when they bump into walls and the container, uh, they have a, a greater, a kind of more, um, greater force uh, when they collide with the wall, um, or you could say they collide more frequently. Okay, either way, you've got to work collisions. So you could say um, particles um, collide with um, the walls of the container uh, with a greater force. Okay, you could say greater, um, uh, greater, uh, um, sorry, uh, more collisions per second, uh, but that's fine. Now, pressure um, is force divided by area. I don't know that equation uh, on combined science, but pressure goes up because there's a greater force in that part of the question. Now, that is a kind of quite common thing to come, so make sure you memorize it word perfectly. Um, okay, next one it says the device. Um, to work, the air in the chamber must increase in temperature um, very quickly. How did it go about doing that? So why is it made of metal rather than plastic? Um, that should be, I have to cross that out there accidentally, um, that should be kind of obvious what metal is. Now, metal is a better conductor, okay? Now, you can say metal is a better conductor. Um, I'm going to write that one down here because it's probably more likely a thing to say um, are a better or better conductor than plastic. Um, the thing mark schemes will have in, though, and it's on your spec, as you say, you have a higher, um, what's called thermal, conductivity so it is a better word to say you'd get conductor as a mark um, in this question uh, but thermal conductivity is far more likely to come up uh, because then you can talk about the next thing uh, which means if it has a high a better conductor or higher thermal conductivity the definition for that is um, which means it has a they, they have sorry metals they have a greater rate of energy transfer or heat or thermal energy transfer I should say a thermal energy transfer. So make sure you realize that as a definition of thermal conductivity is how much um, something, uh, how what rate of thermal energy transfer material has. If it's higher, it has a higher rate. Um, the property of air that allows a change in internal energy to cause a large temperature change is something called specific um, heat capacity. That's a bit of a sneaky one. I think what he kind of throws people off in this question. Uh, specific heat capacity is this equation here essentially means that um, you can have amount of energy and it talks about the temperature and um, so that's the equation that might lead you to that answer in that question um, if you wanted to um, cause the wheel to turn a different speed as a few different things you could talk about um, I would say the easiest one is lubricate it um, okay to reduce the the friction um, there's a few other things you could talk about here but that's probably the easiest one overall Okay, now to finish off uh, this paper, we've got one of the hardest uh, types of questions you can get, uh, which is called a multi-step uh, uh, equation. So not just using uh, one step to solve uh, an equation, you've got to use more than one uh, formula, one, more than one equations to solve it. How do you know it's like that? Well, you've got loads of information in it, and it's six marks, um, even without doing anything with uh, it's, um, standard form or anything like that. Now, these questions can be horrible, really, really daunting. So what I would do is make a little note down the side of any equations that you think might be useful, okay? So we've got temperature, let's start underlining things and think of an equations. We've got internal energy, we've got density, we've got volume, we've got specific heat capacity, we're trying to find final temperature, okay? Now, there's a couple of terms in here where there's only one equation in the equation sheet. So density, for example, is equal to mass divided by volume. That sounds like it might be kind of useful. Uh, we've also got, um, specific heat capacity equation, which is energy equals mass times specific heat capacity times by temperature change. Um, actually, once we've done that, there's not really anything we've missed out because we've got uh, density, we talked about volume, uh, energy, temperature, those are the two we are gonna use, okay? Now for the final temperature, um, we're gonna use the specific heat capacity equation. So let's have a look at what we've got so far. Um, so we've got the um, specific heat capacity, which it tells us, we've got the energy, but we don't have the mass. Now the trick here is then to realize, well, I can get the mass in another way by using the density equation, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me, so let's write this down in full and let's see where we get. It's always a good idea, even if you can't get to the end with these questions, just write down an equation and work out something correctly and you're more likely not to get two or three marks from it anyway. So density, it tells us, uh, it's a bit of a tricky standard form in here, so be careful with your calculators. Um, is density is 1.1 times 10 to the power 3. The volume is 1.9 times 10 to the power minus 4. So um, to get rid of the divide by 1.9 times 10 to the minus 4, 
we have to times it by both on both sides so 1.1 .1 times 10 to the power of 3 times by 1.9 times 10 to the power of minus 4 and if you put those all into your calculator you will find the mass of your um, uh, what have we got the coffee um, is equal to 0 0.209 which kind of makes sense okay so that's our second mark for working that out now we've got the mass that's our last piece of our piece of our jigsaw because now we've got energy mass and specific heat capacity we're trying to find the temperature so I'm going to write down my second equation so that's my first and second equation in full over here I'm going to do it in symbol form just because it's quite a long one to write it out um, and let's start putting my values in Okay, so the energy in the question, um, and actually I uh, forgot to do this at the start, um, you should be able to spot this is uh, not the correct unit of energy. Uh, energy is usually in joules, um, so we're going to write down to the side just to make sure that's 15,000 joules in case I uh, forget, because I did forget there. Uh, 15,000 joules, and um, the mass we've just worked out is 0 0.209. Please make sure you write down your value in full so it's obvious uh, where you're getting it from in case you get one part of this um, whole method wrong, times by a temperature change. Okay, so um, we need to get temperature change this little symbol here by itself. So what I'm going to do is instead of uh, the opposite, well, do the opposite of timesing those, which is dividing, and I'm going to put it in brackets. You could do that as a calculation first if you wanted to. That's fine. Um, so if you put those in together, uh, what you'll get is the temperature change. Now the temperature change is not the final temperature, but it will help us get the final temperature. Okay, so that happens to be 17.088, etc., etc. Okay, now doesn't ask for the temperature change, it asks for the final temperature and it tells you that it starts at 76. So the reason I didn't say change in temperature, we don't have it because we don't have a change, we have an initial temperature. So the last one we've got to think about is, is it um, increasing or decreasing in heat? Okay, so it says that the energy decreases. So that's your clue to figure out that the temperature overall will decrease. So the final step is to do 76 minus, and I'm just going to round it here because it'll, it'll be fine to give to two significant figures, uh, which equals 59 degrees Celsius. Now that's definitely one of the hardest um, types of multi-step equations you can get, um, but make sure you practice them because they will be coming. You will get them in your paper. As for the rest of it, I'd say it's probably about medium for question six. Um, so there's a couple of tricky things in there. Um, this one you definitely, definitely, definitely need to memorize because gas pressure has almost the same mark scheme each time. Um, but anyway, that's it. That's the end of the combined science um, paper. Thank you for watching.